So basically about oxidative phosphorylation, uh, it's related to the glycolysis, uh, TCA cycle, as well as electron transport chain. All three pathways, glycolysis, TCA cycle, and ETC, it will lead to oxidative phosphorylation. So you must know what is uh, each of the role of each pathways. Okay, so oxidative phosphorylation is basically uh, the uh, what we call as the production of ATP uh, due to the glycolysis, TCA cycle, and ETC. So the oxidation of metabolic fuels such as glucose, fatty acid, and amino acid. So here, fatty acid and amino acid, they will enter TCA cycle. Okay. as well as the oxidation of acetic carbons to carbon dioxide via Krebs cycle, it yields the uh, NADH to ubiquinol. So this one we will learn later on here, ubi about ubiquinol. So this compound basically are the energy. Okay, They have the uh, what we call as reactive energy because of their oxidation reduction uh, forms. So where electron transfer process through the electron transport chain, ETC, in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So basically towards the end, it will this electron will be accepted by oxygen. Okay, and those overall reaction is basically hexagonic reaction. Remember, I have mentioned start from the glycolysis. If it is hexagonic reaction, if it is very hexagonic reaction, it can happen simultaneously. So that is very important. If it is ender, uh, endergonic reaction, you need other uh, reaction that is hexagonic to couple with that reaction to provide the energy. So if it is hexagonic, you have the energy you have so the tendency is there so the the pathways can happen or direction can happen uh, automatically spontaneously so this free energy from nadh okay is released when it is released it will be harvested uh, harvested to synthesize atp so this is what we call as oxidative phosphorylation okay in other words, huh, the end of aerobic cell respiration. Aerobic cell respiration, remember, glycolysis, it doesn't necessarily need to be in aerobic condition because it doesn't need oxygen. Similarly with TCA cycle. TCA cycle can happen with or without, same with glycolysis. But the most important thing is ETC because towards the end, the electron is being uh, accepted by oxygen. So what we call at the end of this aerobic cell respiration is oxidative, uh, oxidative phosphorylation along the ETC. So this NADH molecule, okay, NADH molecule that have this energy because it has the electron. Okay, so the NADH molecule found in glycolysis and then the NADH and FADH2 that is uh, formed in TCA cycle, they are used to reduce oxygen and generate high energy ATP molecules. Okay, this one you must be, uh, you must understand this well. So, what is, okay, so what is ETC? ETC is a series of protein, okay, that receive high energy electron. Okay, so where does this energy come from? From NADH and FADH2 molecule. Okay, so whatever molecule that has the electron, they must pass it to oxygen, which is the N acceptor. So from NADH and FADH2 molecule, okay, it moves along the inner mitochondria membrane. So you must understand uh, where does this glycolysis occur, TCA cycle occur cytosol, mitochondria, inner mito mitochondria. Remember, ETC, it happened in, uh, at along uh, inner mitochondria membrane. Okay, so that is where ETC, where is, that is where complex 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, embedded. Okay, so this um, final electron acceptor, which is oxygen, 
Okay, in the process, proton gradient is established. So we'll look at it later on. And then, then the, 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 the presence of proton gradient that is used, that we use to pump or to generate this, to create this ATP molecule. Okay, by the activity of special enzyme, what we call as ATP synthase. So here, electron from metabolism, okay, from glycolysis and Krebs cycle, they are in a form of NADH and FADH2. Hold on, I want to accept, approve your friend here. Okay, so here it is is oh some more. So it is is carried out by four closely related multi subunit membrane complex. So we we'll look into this complex later on, and then we have two electron electron carriers like coenzyme Q and cytochrome C. So in this series of oxidation reduction reaction, why we call it a series of oxidation reduction reaction? Because the electron will be passed from one carrier to another carrier. So when it pass electron uh, and then when it receive electron, so there's a oxidation reduction reaction happening. So from FADH2 and NADH, they are transferred uh, from one complex. This complex is complex one, two, three, four to the next until they reach the oxygen, oxygen molecule at the end of the chain of the ETC. And oxygen, molecule is reduced to produce water molecule. So as a result of this electron transport, what is this result? A proton gradient. Eh? So when we transfer electron from one complex to another complex, we also at the same time pump hydrogen ion. So that makes a proton, that creates a proton gradient. So that as a result here is due to the proton gradient. As a result of electron transport, protons are pumped across the inner membrane to the intermembrane space, creating a pH gradient, or we also call them as proton gradients. So these proton gradients that will later on, okay, um, that will uh, create uh, what we call it, uh, will create the ATP molecules through ATP synthase. So the production of ATP in the mitochondria is the result of oxidative phosphorylation. So that is why we have two terms here, ETC, electrode transport chain, and oxidative phosphorylation because they are neighboring. Complex 1, 2, 3, 4, and ATP synthase, they are neighbor. So that's why towards the end, we will produce oxidative, we will have this oxidative phosphorylation. So this proton gradient, it establish a voltage or electrochemical gradient. So here we can have, uh, we can form ATP through phosphorylation of ADP. Remember from glycolysis, I've mentioned a lot about phosphorylation. So what is phosphorylation? It's the additional of phosphate group in organic phosphate to ADP. So when there's a phosphorylation of ADP, meaning it is to form ATP molecule. So this is the mitochondria intermembrane. So this is the matrix. So this is mitochondria intermembrane space. So this is in between. Okay. So here we have this complex. So this is just roughly, we'll go into detail later on. So this is complex number one. Complex number two here, three. Okay. And then complex number four. And then this is our ATP synthase. 
Okay, since they are embedded like a neighbor here, so that is why what we call towards the end, this is like oxidative phosphorylation here. When ATP is being produced by ATP synthase. Okay, you can look into it here that when we when we move electron across the across uh, from one complex to other complex, uh, we pump hydrogen ion from the matrix mitochondria. Okay, uh, and then we pump the electron over here. Okay, when it pump it here, what happened is this is inner membrane, uh, inner membrane space. Okay, when we pump from matrix to the inner membrane space, what happened? There will be a lot of hydrogen ion here. So when one electron being transported, uh, in complex one, four hydrogen ion. In complex two, no pumping. Later on, we'll see. In complex three, another. Uh, this is two hydrogen ion. In complex four, this sorry. In complex three, it's four hydrogen ion, and in complex two, it's two hydrogen ion being pumped. Okay, so there will be a lot of proton here. So what happened is when there's a lot of proton here, it will uh, create the proton gradient. Okay, so here there's a lot of proton here compared to in the matrix, uh, mitochondria matrix. So what happened, it will create the proton gradient and it will, um, what we call as force the ATP synthase to create, to phosphorylate uh, uh, ADP uh, and produce and form ATP. So this is what have uh, uh, the mechanism that helps to generate the ATP. So because of this unequal distribution of hydrogen ion causes the spontaneous movement of hydrogen from the matrix to the inner membrane space, okay, create the electrochemical gradient and helps generate the ATP. So basically, uh, so this is the outer mitochondrial membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane. So where is high concentration of hydrogen ion, low concentration of hydrogen ion. Okay, and then we have due to this um, difference in the uh, electro electrochemical gradient, it can force ATP synthase to form ATP or to generate the ATP. So to summarize the introduction, uh, so electron transport from one carrier to another. So this is what's in the carrier itself. That is why uh, this is the carrier. I mean, carrier in the each of the complex. So electron transport from one carrier to another carrier, it creates the proton gradient across the inner mitochondria membrane. So you must get it right, huh? where it passes from matrix to inner mitochondria. So when the proton gradient is happen, occur, so the proton gradient is coupled to the production of ATP in aerobic metabolism because end product would be, or end acceptor would be uh, oxygen number oxygen molecule so here is the here are the all acceptor fmn coenzyme q cytochrome c1 cytochrome c cytochrome a a3 and towards the end oxygen okay before we move into complex uh, complex one two three four we look into a bit of reduction potential Okay, I won't teach a lot of this reduction potential. Just want to let you have an idea how they can, how the electron can be moved from one to another. So, for example, here um, is to consider the change in free energy associated with the movement of electron from one carrier to another carrier. So, how can how electron can jump from one to another? So if we have two electron carrier, for example, NADH and coenzyme Q. Okay, in case you haven't noticed, NADH is electron carrier. Why? Because remember NADH, it gives, uh, sorry, remember in glycolysis and TCA cycle, where NAD plus, plus H plus to produce NADH, 
Okay, when it accept hydrogen ion, it also accept electron. So remember, electron is in the in this molecule. So that is why we call NADH and FADH as a electron carrier itself. Okay, so for example, here NADH and coenzyme Q, they are uh, this electron are more likely to be transferred from NADH to coenzyme Q. Do you know why? Because of the reduction potential. Okay, so NADH and coenzyme Q, one of them has high reduction potential and another has low reduction potential. So here, a carrier of high reduction potential will tend to be reduced if it is paired with carrier of lower reduction potential. So that is how it works. So of course, if there's a reduction potential, it involves here. It involves the uh, it involves you accept electron or you give off uh, you give away the electron. So when it happens, it is automatically a redox reaction. Redox meaning reduction oxidation re uh, reaction. So this reaction is similar in other reactions, okay, where electron in this case is transferred from one to another. So in this redox reaction or in, in general all redox reaction, okay, we have this reactant called as oxidizing agent or oxidant, uh, oxidant. Okay, so this reactant is reduced as it gains electron and other reactant is oxidized as it gives up electron. So you must get this right. If it is reduced, it is uh, if it is reduced, it gains electron. If it is oxidized, meaning it gives up electron or it gives away the electron. So here uh, is example for TCA cycle. For succinate dehydrogenase reaction, which is step number six in the TCA cycle. So we have two electrons of the reduced FADH2. Remember, FADH2 meaning it has hydrogen ion at the same time. If it has hydrogen ion here, meaning it has this electron here. Okay, so they are uh, FADH2, uh, uh, FADH2 is a carrier, electron carrier. So in the two electron of the reduced FADH2 okay, of the enzyme transferred to ubiquinone. Ubiquinone here is in complex number one, uh, also symbolized as Q. So that FADH2 is oxidized and ubiquinone is reduced. Okay, hopefully you can get these terms right huh? when we are going to read uh, when FADH2 is being reduced or is being oxidized. Okay, so FADH2 in reduced form plus ubiquinone, okay, Q here, and then uh, in this direction, you get FAD in the, an oxidized form to form ubiquinone. Ubiquinone is QH2, meaning it accepts hydrogen ion. Okay, later on we'll look into it into detail. So this is one example where one react we have one reactant okay as electron uh, where it gives up electron and one reactant where it receives electron. Okay. So in this reaction, two electrons transferred as H hydrogen atoms, okay. And H atom consists of a proton and electron. Okay, H plus and electron. So for the ratio of NAD plus over NADH conjugate redox pair, the electron are transported as hydride ions. So this is when um, for NADH, uh, for NADH, okay, why NADH it it it, it carries two electrons. Because they are formed as hydride ion H negative. Okay, so here for FADH2, it 
uh, it transfer to electron. For NADH, it also transfer to electron. But you can see here, okay, you can see here hydrogen is not two. FADH two, but here NADH is also only as NADH. Okay, it produce NAD plus plus H plus plus two electron. So this is the difference between FADH2 and NADH because NADH they are transported as hydride ion H negative. Okay, so this H negative are equivalent to H plus plus two E, meaning NADH will also carries two electron. Okay, similar with FADH2 also carries two electron. So these are the list of the reduction potential. You can see from the value here, higher value meaning higher possibilities for it to accept the electron. Okay, the reduction potential is higher. Okay, uh, hold a second. Does some of your friends still need approving? So hold on, how many, how many of us in this biochemistry? Eh? Do you know how many of your colleagues here or friends here should be in biochemistry uh, subject? Here, I only have 150 students. This is... Wait, uh, uh, give me one minute, huh? Let me see first. Oh, uh, uh, what happened? Only 150, two ex one only have excuse. This is crazy. Or oh, should I just record everything? Which one is better? Online teaching like this, or I just record like the previous previous lecture or previous uh, topics, glycolysis and TCA cycle? Record is better, doctor. Recording is better because recording, I found that recording, there's no cursor. When, when, when I look into it, I cannot, um, during my recording, I can move my cursor. But then, can you see the cursor? Because sometimes I want to show show everything, show the reaction. There's no... Oh, in presentation, you cannot see? Yes, we cannot see as well. It's so hard. <laughs> this is frustrating. So how can I show you the... How can I show you the reaction? Because we, I need the cursor. That's the purpose of I'm doing this online teaching. Yeah. Oh, this is what to do. So if I teach you this, because when we move to the complex, huh, when I explain about all those complexes, I need to show you the reaction.
screen record. Wow, why is so complicated? Okay, let's see. Since let let make use of this uh, online teaching here. If you need, if you have question, just ask on the microphone and directly ask me. Because during recording you cannot ask. Okay, so this one just ask me first, and then later on, uh, I will I will edit everything and do it similar way with glycolysis and TCA cycle. Okay, I will put the recording in in the YouTube and send you the link. But then since oh only I can see the the cursor, this is bad. Uh, doctor. Yes. Um, actually, there's a tab when you open for the presentation that can change the cursor into like laser pointer. Maybe you can see. Okay. Uh, I I can't really hear you again. Come again. Uh, louder. Uh, sorry. Uh, when we open the presentation, right? There's yeah. a tab on the left corner, left down corner. That we can left change or right now. Oh, no. Left down, I think. So. Is it when we open it into the slide form, the presentation okay. form? Okay, I open the slide then. <laughs> and then uh there's the presentation one bigger, the larger one. The slide one or the and the slide one, yeah. Ah uh, yeah, the slide one. And then Later, there's a tab down there. Yeah. Then we can change the cursor into a laser pointer, the red color point that then we can oh, see. I cannot get this. I can only see stop sharing or hide only. Only this cursor. Is there any more cursor? Mm. <laughs> oh, I'm new. I'm a student as well. Because I really want to show you how I really need the cursor. Mm. Okay. Uh, I can I will just hide this first. Cannot have because the 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 view in this slide is like PowerPoint slide. <laughs> Nothing special. Here, when I move my cursor here, you cannot see. I'm moving. No, cannot see. No, doctor. This is bad. Okay. So, if in this case, ask me if you don't understand. Because you really, really, really need to understand about those complexes. Okay, just move on. Huh? So, complex number one is what we call as NADH uh, coenzyme Q oxidoreductase. So, also known as NADH dehydrogenase. So, so there's, there's several names of those complex. So, oxidoreductase because there's an oxidation reduction reaction between NADH and coenzyme Q. Or we also call them as NADH dehydrogenase because in this complex one of subunit, they are basically about NADH. So, from the figure here, you can see they are L-shaped multi-subunit uh, multi -subunit protein. So, it's L-shaped, vertical and horizontal. So, that vertical part, it's moved towards the matrix of mitochondria. And the horizontal parts, they are embedded in the inner mitochondria membrane. Okay? So, Located this large L-shaped multi-subunit protein located on the inner membrane of mitochondria. So along that. Okay. But then the L-shapes, it slightly like slightly move into um not move, it's slightly embedded in the matrix. Okay. So it accepts high energy electron from NADH molecule where electrons are passed from NADH to FMN. So we can see here, now I'm thinking about the figure. So look at the figure. It's about this FMN. So this FMN is, where is it? Flavin mononucleotide. So electrons are transferred. You can see NADH plus H plus here. 
Okay, in glycolysis, in Krebs cycle, we are producing NADH plus H plus. Remember, from NAD plus, produce or form NADH plus H plus. Okay, that is in glycolysis and TCA cycle. So here in ETC is in another way. Okay, because it needs the electron. So what happened is it is NADH plus H plus producing NAD plus. So this NAD plus will later on move back and be recycled, regenerate to produce uh, to be used in glycolysis and TCA cycle. So this NAD plus uh, and later on FAD, okay, they are being used back again, okay, like a cycle. So remember, in this complex, we talk about NADH plus H plus forming NAD plus. So the electron transport uh, from NADH to FMN, flavin mononucleotide. From FMN, remember this is a electron carrier, meaning it carries carries a protein. Uh, sorry, it carries electron. Okay, so from FMN, the electron can pass to ferrum sulfate. So ferrum sulfate here is not only one ferrum sulfate. This is a cluster of ferrum sulfate. Okay, meaning there will be uh, there's a two three ferrum sulfate here in this complex. Okay, just focus on the on the figure here. So electron are passed from NADH to FMN. Okay, EFMN indicates that the flavin is covalently bonded to the enzyme. Okay, this carrier they are in the they are bound in the enzyme. Okay, they are in the enzyme. They cannot move. They only carry. So they pass from electron one. They pass from uh. FMN, it pass electron to ferrum sulfate cluster. So the NADH molecule, it donates the two electrons. So remember, two electrons, huh? okay, onto the acceptor. So acceptor here is FMN. So the acceptor group found on the vertical component of complex one. So the enzyme, they are at the vertical one, not at the horizontal, uh, not on the horizontal parts of the enzyme okay they are embedded on the vertical component of complex one what we call as fmn so this fmn is then reduced into fmn h2 form okay this is uh this fmn h2 is the um, similar with the efmn okay so the electron then move along the series of iron sulfur group iron sulfur group here is ferrum sulfide Ferrum is iron, uh, sulfur groups, and transferred to coenzyme Q. So you can see here, coenzyme Q, where is the co coenzyme Q? At the horizontal parts of the enzyme. Okay, FMN, ferrum sulfur group, as is, uh, they are embedded at the horizontal part, and coenzyme Q is on the uh, vertical, eh, sorry, FMN and FES at the vertical part. And Q, coenzyme Q is at the horizontal part. Okay. So coenzyme Q here, Q here in the red box here. Can you see? Uh? I hope you can see the Q there. Okay. The figure from the figure. Okay. The Q here is what we call as ubiquinone. Q. Ubiquinone. Uh, N O N E. Ubiquinone. So this. Um, okay. This ubiquinone, when it accepts. Electron, uh, electron from NADH pass to FMN, FMN pass to ferrum sulfate cluster, ferrum sulfate cluster pass to coenzyme Q. So this coenzyme Q, when it accepts this electron, okay, uh, it becomes ubiquinol. Okay, this ubiquinol is what we call as QH2. Hold on. Uh. So this Q here, it will becomes QH2, okay? All right, the one that moves from one to another is two electron, okay? But as well as hydrogen ion, H plus here, okay? That is why toward the ends, the Q enzyme Q from ubiquinone, it becomes ubiquinol, QH2. 
Okay, so as the electron moves through the series of ferrum sulfate cluster, the enzyme complex use this electrical works to pump for hydrogen ion. Okay, when we pass the electron from NADH to FMN, FMN to ferrum sulfate cluster, okay, the movement of electron, okay, it gives the electrical works. So this complex use this electrical works to pump for hydrogen ion from the matrix, okay, from the matrix into the intermembrane space. You can see from the arrow, pink arrow there, okay, it pump for hydrogen ion from matrix to the intermembrane space. Okay, remember Q still accepts, Q also contain two electron and H2. Uh, that is why it becomes QH2, which is ubiquinol. But at the same time, due to this electrochemical gradient, they can pump, okay, they can pump four hydrogen ion from matrix to the intermembrane space. Do you have question of this? Do you have any question about this complex one first? Anyone have no question? Just on your mic or do, if you can understand. Can you understand about this? Yes, doctor. So here, so here two electron. Hold on. So here, the movement of two electron, they cannot move by themselves. Therefore, they must be attached to the FMN. Okay. So how they can attach to the FMN or later on ferrum sulfate and QR coenzyme Q, it needs the hydrogen ion. So hydrogen ion from NADH and H+, they are used to move the electron. They are together. You cannot move electron by yourself. Because there's no, this is uh, organic chemistry. Electron cannot be moved just by electron. They need proton. So here, hydrogen ion uh, from the NADH, the hydrogen from NADH, okay, and H+, they are used to move the electron. That is why FMN will be reduced to FMNH2. Okay, and then uh, go to FES and then uh, transfer to coenzyme Q. That is why as well, coenzyme Q here, ubiquinone here becomes ubiquinone which is QH2. Okay, so the trans uh, transferring of electron are together with hydrogen ion. That is complex number one. So here... You can see electron are passed to the iron sulfur cluster. So the last step of complex one involve electron being passed to coenzyme Q, which are also known as ubiquinone. So ubiquinone is Q. Ubiquinone here is QH2. So you can see from here coenzyme Q, the coenzyme QH2. Okay, QH2 itself it is ubiquinone. Okay. This one, you must really stick to your head. Ubiquinol is Q, ubiquinol is QH2 because a lot of this term will be used in these complexes. All right, here. Okay, this one don't need. This one don't need. So uh, then we move to complex, complex two. So complex two is succinate coenzyme Q oxidoreductase or also known as succinate reductase. So this complex Q, uh, so this complex two is basically a protein complex that contains succinate dehydrogenase which function in TCA cycle. So from the figure, okay, you can see that uh, there's a complex 2 embedded towards the matrix. Okay. So, they are slightly in the matrix. Okay, compared to the inner membrane. So, here, this complex 2, it converts succinate to fumarate 
and generate FADH2. Remember the step number six in TCA cycle. Okay, succinate to fumarate forming FADH2. This FADH2, they are not going anywhere in TCA cycle. Okay, remember that this is why I ask you to learn about TCA cycle first. In TCA cycle, in step number six, succinate change to or converted to fumarate plus uh, and it produce FADH2 in the reaction. So that FADH2, it doesn't go anywhere. It's stuck or it bounds to this enzyme. Okay, enzyme succinate dehydrogenase. So this enzyme is similar here. The same FADH2 is in this complex number two. So when it accepts, when FAD being, uh, when FADH2 being formed from FAD plus from TCA cycle, those FADH2 in complex number two is used, um, is uh, this electron okay will be picked up by coenzyme Q okay so coenzyme Q in complex one and coenzyme Q in complex two are not the same coenzyme Q meaning they are two different they are coenzyme Q they are ubiquinol okay, sorry they are ubiquinon Q but let's say uh, complex one co is ubiquinon one complex two is ubiquinon two. They do not like pick up all electrons all the way. Meaning, how to say it? Meaning, at the end they are only forming QH two, not QH four. Huh? It will form QH four if it accept electron from complex one and complex two together, but not in this case. In this case, both form QH two. Meaning. It only accept electron from complex one, then it will go to complex three. Similar, uh, for succin, uh, for this complex two, different different coenzyme Q, meaning different molecule of ubiquinone will accept electron from FADH two, and form QH two ubiquinone. So this ubiquinone will later move to complex number three. Okay. They are not uh, coenzyme Q here is not like uh, is not like a driver or acceptor that okay go to complex one then singa then stop by to complex two pick up electron no they move from complex one directly to complex three or complex two directly to complex three understand so that's basically about this carrier ubiquinone. Okay, it only form ubiquinol QH two, meaning it only accept two electron at one time. Okay, so this overall reaction is hexagonic. Okay, so it it is spontaneously once it form FADH two from TCA cycle, FADH two will quickly um give up the electron and coenzyme Q, ubiquinone here will pick up the electron okay and forming FAD plus so coenzyme uh, so, so ubiquinone here will become ubiquinol QH2. Here in complex number two what make it different with complex number one is that there's no hydrogen pumping. Hello doctor. Yes. Uh, someone cannot join to the meeting. So here, what makes complex two and complex one? What makes them different is that complex one. Remember, we pump four like uh, four hydrogen plus, okay, but not in complex two. There's no hydrogen being pumped from matrix two into membrane space for this complex number two. Although the overall reaction is hexagonic, but it is not enough to drive the ATP production. Therefore, no hydrogen ion is pumped out of the matrix during complex number two. Okay, so complex number one, it pumps for H+. Plus. Complex number two, no hydrogen ion. Okay.
Okay, so let's move to complex number three. Okay, so this complex number three is the same process which uh, electron travel huh, from QH2, meaning ubiquinol, to cytochrome C. Some more. Okay, this complex 3 is also known as coenzyme QH2 cytochrome C oxidoreductase or cytochrome reductase. It catalyzes the transfer of electron from ubiquinol. Remember ubiquinol being formed from complex 1 and complex 2. Okay, complex 1, the electron acceptor is ubiquinone. Okay, and then when it accepts electron to electron, it becomes ubiquinol QH2. Same with complex number two, where it receives uh, electron from FADH2 and ubiquinone become ubiquinol QH2. So for complex number three, it accepts this electron from ubiquinol QH2. So here it accepts two electrons from ubiquinol. Okay. It, uh, so this complex 3, it catalyzes the transfer of electron from ubiquinol QH2 to cytochrome C. So it contains several structures in the, in the enzyme itself. Chromo, uh, cytochrome C1, which has one heme group. Cytochrome B contains two heme groups. And we have also one recenter. Recenter, it contains two Fe, two ion, two sulfate group. 2FE, 2S groups. Okay. So here in this complex number 3, okay, this cycle begins when ubiquinol binds to the complex from uh, complex uh, 3. Okay. When it binds, these two electrons, it follow different pathways. Let me see. Okay, here. Okay, no cursor here. Okay, look at this complex number three. Just focus on this complex number three. Okay, ubiquino QH2, it carries two electrons. Okay, but here, cytochrome C, it can accept only one electron at one time. Okay, so what happened with another one electron? Okay, that is why lots of error here in complex number three. One electron go to cytochrome C. And then this cytochrome, uh, this electron, when it's being picked up by cytochrome C, this cytochrome C will transfer it to the complex number four. That is only for one electron. So what happened to another electron? Remember, QH2 carries two electrons, but cytochrome can only accept one electron at one time. Okay, that is where the risk uh, center comes into place. So receptor, uh, risk center here is. Uh, at the center of this complex number three. Okay, here uh, two electron it follows different pathways. Okay, uh, one electron it moves to uh, two Fe to F, so the ferrum sulfate cluster. Okay, group of risk center. Remember, risk center it contains two Fe to S. Huh? so. One molecule, uh, sorry, one electron, it moves onto the 2Fe to S group of recenter and transfer to the HEM group of cytochrome C1. And then it pick up by cytochrome, cytochrome, okay? And then pick up by cytochrome C, which diffuse away and travel to complex number four. Okay, you can see up there. Uh, one electron pick up by for a cluster of uh, by two Fe to S group of the recenter transfer to the HEM group of cytochrome C1. You can see C1 from the figure there. Okay, pick up by the HEM group from cytochrome C1 and then uh, then pick up again by cytochrome C and then cytochrome C will diffuse away, travel to complex number four. Okay, that is one pathway. So the second electron, okay, 
the second electron move into the hem group of cytochrome B. Okay, remember we have different structure in the in this enzyme. So we have this cytochrome B. So another electron travel to the cytochrome B before being picked up by the Q ubi quinone. Okay, so it's not shown here, but it's been picked up by Q. Okay, when it is being picked up by Q, remember Q ubi quinone becomes ubiquinol QH2 when it accepts two electrons. But here, it only accepts one electron. So, it doesn't become QH2. It becomes semiquinol radical ion, which are also uh, known as QE negative. So, because it is partially reduced to form semiquinol radical ion. I think I have, I didn't put it here. In this slide, so I just mentioned. So make sure you 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 get that. Okay, okay. I just repeat again. Ah, huh? ubiquinone. It becomes ubiquinol QH two by accepting two electron. But here in complex number three, since one electron has been accepted by cytochrome C, only one electron is, is uh, will be accepted by uh, ubiquinone. So ubiquinone Q just now, okay, it becomes semiquinone, okay, it cannot become QH2, it becomes semiquinone radical ion, also known as QE negative, okay, because it only accepts one electron. So, now, the, it just stay there, okay, so what happened is, okay, another QH2 attached into the complex, just now, one QH2 attached to the complex and then it gives one electron to cytochrome uh, to ferrum sulfate group to cytochrome C1 and cytochrome C and then it moves to complex number 4. Okay, another one electron, it goes to the recenter to cytochrome B, okay, and then pick up by quinone and becomes semiquinone. So that semiquinone, it on the complex number three. It embedded in complex number three. It stay there. So imagine there's another QH2 coming, okay, from complex one or complex two. It coming bind to the complex number three. So what happened is the cycle repeats. Huh? One electron goes to the ferrum sulfate cluster, goes to cytochrome one, being accepted by cytochrome C, diffuse away, goes to complex number four. Okay, so what happened is the second electron, this is the second cycle. Huh? So the second electron, it binds to cytochrome B and it binds to the semiquinone radical ion. No longer Q, no longer ubiquinone. Because remember, it, one electron has, uh, it has accept one electron. Q, ubiquinone has accepted one electron and becomes semiquinone radical ion in the first cycle of QH2, okay, in the first cycle just now. And then when the second QH2 bind, okay, one electron goes up to cytochrome, one electron pick up by semi-radical ion, then it becomes QH2, okay. So semi-radical ion, when it pick up the this uh, one electron, then it can become QH2. Okay, the second pair, uh, sorry, the, the sec this is another cycle. So the second pair of electron, okay, I just repeat, uh, it, they will just go through the same pathway as the before, uh, as before, except for the now uh, QH2 is generated instead of uh, semiquinone because semiquinone that accept the one electron and becomes QH2. Can you understand this part? This part is quite tricky. Eh? So this is what we call as Q cycle. What I mentioned is this is Q cycle. It uh, it exists in three form. It can exist as ubiquinone Q. It can exist as ubiquinol QH2 as well as it can exist as semiquinone QE negative which is a radical ion 
Okay, understand I, this one? So, what happened to this QH2 in the complex number 3? Okay. So, QH2, they are then oxidized into Q, ubiquinone. So, at the same time, it can release four hydrogen ion. Okay. So, then when it releases four hydrogen ion, that is why in complex number three, four hydrogen ion are released from the matrix to the intermembrane space. Understand? So, in this cycle, okay, in this cycle, we use two ubiquinol. Remember, one cycle use one, okay, second cycle, another one. So, total of two QH2, two uh, ubiquinol uh, bind to the complex number three, okay, oxidized into ubiquinol. It released four hydrogen ion. One, um, uh, and two cytochrome C molecule are reduced. Okay, four hydrogen ion are released from matrix to the intermembrane. Okay, this part, can you understand why two, uh, why two QH2, uh, why two ubiquinol, why two molecule of cytochrome C? Can you understand this? Because um, you you have to imagine uh, one QH2 because one cycle use one QH2 goes to cytochrome C since only it accept one electron and another electron goes to ubiquinone in the complex, complex number three. Okay, another QH2 ubiquinol comes and bind, one electron goes to another cytochrome C. Okay, cytochrome C here comes and go. Okay, so another uh, another electron bind to, cyto uh, being released, accepted by cytochrome C, cytochrome C move to complex number four. And then one electron goes to the semiquinone. First round, it, it first round is quinone. Second round, it becomes ubiquinone because uh, quinone has been reduced to semiquinone in the first round. So when it becomes for the second cycle, it becomes semiquinone, and when it accepts electron, it becomes QH two uh, ubiquinone. Okay, that is why in this complex number three, we have two cytochrome uh, two QH two. Two ubiquinol, um, two cytochrome C, four hydrogen ion being pumped from matrix to the intermembrane space. Understand? Okay, I hope you can understand uh, because I'm going to move to complex number four. Okay, complex four is cytochrome C oxidase. Okay, it catalyzes the final step in electron transport. So this is the overall reaction. So it contains cytochrome A, cytochrome A3 and copper 2 or cuprum 2. Okay, they are involved in the electron transport. Okay, this cuprum 2 later on will be reduced to cuprum 1. Two hem group, hem A, hem A3, two copper atoms, uh, copper A, copper, copper A, copper A over copper A and copper B. Later on we look into it. So, complex number four is the link to the molecular oxygen. So, let's see what happened here. So, this is the um, complex four. In the, in, what's inside the complex four? Okay, we have copper A, copper A, or cuprum A, cuprum A. Okay, and then this electron from uh, cytochrome C, yeah? from cytochrome C, okay, it accept electron. Uh, this complex four it accept two electron, okay. This two electron being passed to cuprum A or copper A, copper A, and then it passed to hem A, okay. From hem A, from him, him, no, not hem, huh? from him A, okay. One electron being uh, accepted by him A three, one electron being accepted by cuprum B, copper B, okay. Although it accept two electron, only one being accept by A3 and one being accept by cuprum B. Then what happened is since one accept one, uh, since him A3 and cuprum B accept one electron each. Okay, we move to the next, uh, next box here. We have A3 and then cuprum B there. 
with the peroxide bi bridge. So that is where what we call as peroxide bridge with oxygen and oxygen. Huh? So that's that's the structure. Okay, once him A3 and cuprum B are in their reduced form because it accept the electron. Huh? Okay, this what happen is oxygen molecule can bind. Okay, if it is in its oxidized form, oxygen molecule cannot bind. Only when it is in its reduced form can oxygen molecule bind to them. So what happen is when they are in their reduced form, okay, oxygen molecule can bind and then it can abstract two electrons to form this peroxide bridge between him A3 and cuprum B like in this um, second box here. Okay, so it has this, oh, I forgot the, the radical ion on the on the oxygen there. So basically, him A3, cuprum B, it creates the peroxide bridge. Okay, then, then you can see from the third box there with OH, OH, H with red color there. Okay, what happened there is that Another two more of reduced cytochrome C molecule are oxidized to transfer additional two electron and two H plus. Whenever there's a two electron, of course, there will be two H plus. Okay. To obtain uh, two H plus will be transferred from the matrix to break up the peroxide bridge to form here. Cuprum B OH and him A3 OH. So... Where does this H comes from? Is from the H plus from the matrix. Okay. So this H plus from the matrix is being used to break up this peroxide bridge. Okay. What happened is H, the, when, when they use this H ion, okay, it attached to the hem A3 and cuprum B. Then it can release H2O molecule, water molecule. Okay, so the abstraction of two hydrogen ion from the matrix, it oxidizes the, he, uh, the heme A3 and cupumbri into their original state. Okay, remember where when it is in their oxidized form, which is in their uh, original state, they cannot attach to anything, even the oxygen molecule. But when it is reduced, okay, remember when it accepts one electron from uh, one electron for him A3, one electron for cuprum B, the molecule are being reduced. When it is reduced, oxygen can come and bind. When oxygen can come and bind, it creates this peroxide bridge. When it creates the oxide bridge, uh, this peroxide bridge, what happens is two hydrogen ions from the matrix go into the complex. What happens is it breaks down this peroxide bridge attached to the hem A3 and cuprum B. And then uh, when it attached, what happens is this hem A3 and cuprum B being oxidized back again to its original form. So when it is in its original form, it cannot uh, bind to this OH OH. So they break up being released as water molecule. Understand? Huh? So this is complex number four. So overall reaction of this, okay, we we finish about all those electron transport uh, complex, sorry. Complex one, two, three, four. Okay, with this, what is this? Okay, this is basically the overall reaction of complex from complex one to uh, complex four with the overall reaction. Okay, start from complex one to complex four. NADH plus H plus plus half oxygen. Okay, producing NAD plus plus H2O. If we have if we use one oxygen molecule, then we will form two mole uh, uh, water molecules here. Remember here, if we use half oxygen molecule, as if we use one oxygen molecule, mm, you can have these types of peroxide bridge. And then you can form two molecules of water. 
Okay. So overall reaction is here. NADH plus H plus. Which electron. Um, which they give electron to complex number four. Uh, number one. And then this is at complex number four. So what is the connection between electron transport and phosphorylation? So it gives rise to proton pumping and as a pH gradient across the inner mitochondria membrane. So what happened is there's a differences of concentration in ions huh, that creates the voltage gradient. So when there's a voltage, voltage gradient, meaning there's an electrochemical potential. So this electrochemical potential, it gives the chemical energy to produce or to form ATP molecule. So the coupling factor is ATP synthase, which also known as mitochondria ATPase. Okay, what is mitochondria? Uh, what is ATPase? It is a protein oligomer, okay, uh, separate from the electron transport complex. Just always oh, our picture. Here. Okay, it's separated. So this is ATP synthase, the oligomer molecule. It's separate from other complexes. Give me one, give me a few, uh, few seconds. So, so far, do you have any more question? Uh, do you have any question? Hello? Okay. Do you have any question for this uh, before I go into the ATP synthesis? Okay. Okay. So, what's the connection? <clears throat> So what's the connection between electron transport and phosphorylation? Okay, just like I mentioned, so it creates the electrochemical potential for the ATP production. So the coupling factor is ATP synthase, also known as mitochondria ATPase. Okay, it's separate from the electron transport complexes, one to four. <coughs> okay, if we have uncoupler, Anything that act as an, uh, if it is an, uh, if it is uncoupler, so uncoupler, uncoupler, it inhibit the phosphorylation of ADP without affecting electron transport. For example, of uncoupler here are 2,4-dinitrophenol, valinomycin, grami, uh, gramicidin. So what happened is, for ETC and oxidative phosphorylation, they are coupled together. Uh, the the electrochemical gradient that function as um, um energy okay to um to produce ATP uh to have this phosphorylation of ADP to ATP okay but if there's an uncoupler okay, it will inhibit uh, the phosphorylation of ADP meaning ATP will not be produced but ETC uh, electron transport from complex number one to complex number four still happening, okay? The the electron transport still happen, but 
it the 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 coupling of between uh, etc and um, oxidative phosphorylation will not happen okay so this uh, a bit just a bit on what is uncoupler so this is the components of atp synthase it consists of f1 f f0 component here okay this is the f1 and this is only an f0 okay of atp synthase so okay this is 2 4 dinitrophenol uh, example of uncoupler here this one okay before we move to atp synthase uh, the coupling of etc uh, electron transport to oxidative phosphorylation it requires a multi subunit membrane bound enzyme atp synthase or also known as atpase so this enzyme it has a channel for protons to flow from the intermembrane space into the mitochondria matrix. Okay, remember from complex one to complex four, we pump electron together with the electron transport from matrix to the intermembrane space. So here in this ATP synthase, electron, uh, sorry, hydrogen ion being pumped from the intermembrane to the matrix okay opposite way so the proton flow is coupled to atp production uh, in a process that appears to involve conformational change of this enzyme atp synthase so this chemoosmotic coupling which are directly influenced by the proton gradients is directly linked to the ATP production. It is based on proton concentration gradient between intermembrane space and matrix mitochondria. Remember when we have pump in, pump out the hydrogen ion. So there's a lot of hydrogen ion now in the intermembrane space at the end of complex number four, uh, when electron have been passed from one to four. Okay, a proton gradient exists because of the various proteins that serve as electron carriers. Okay, they are not symmetrically oriented with respect to the two sides of the inner mitochondrial membrane. So what they what what this statement wants to highlight is that okay, we have moved the hydrogen ion from matrix to the intermembrane space together with the uh, transportation of electron from complex one to complex four. So when this protein, this protein here is complex, huh? all those complex one to four, it takes up proton from the matrix when they are reduced and release them to the intermembrane space when they are oxidized. Okay, and the reaction of NADH, coenzyme Q or quinone and oxygen, all it require protons or H+. Okay, here. So four hydrogen pump in, four hydrogen pump in, two hydrogen pump in, uh, sorry, hydrogen ion, uh, okay, pump in from matrix to mitochondria. So a total of four, four, eight, nine, ten. So ten hydrogen ion. So later on we'll calculate ten hydrogen ion will pump uh, one second later on that one. Okay, so we have this chemiosmotic coupling. Huh? Mm. So the mechanism by which proton gradients lead to the production of ATP, it depends on the ion channel through the inner mitochondria membrane. Remember the F0, F1 subunit? So where is the F0, where is the F1 of ATP synthase? So proton flow back into the matrix through F0 channel of ATP synthase and the formation of ATP in the F1 unit of ATP synthase. Okay, remember F0 is the proton flow, F1 is the formation of ATP. So that is how, uh, this is why we need to two compartments of ATP synthase. Okay, we have this 
Okay, you can see from this figure, we have F0 in green color, F1 in blue color. Okay, what is F0? F0, proton flow, F1, ATP formation. Okay, here, okay, increase hydrogen concentration, uh, hydrogen ion concentration in the intermembrane space. Okay, you know why already. Okay, now we need to move the hydrogen ion due to the differences in concentration. Okay, so you, we need to uh, move the hydrogen ion from intermembrane space to the matrix. So it flows through the F0 channel. Why? Because F0 embedded in the mitochondria membrane. Okay, so when it flows through this F0 channel, what happened is it also creates a gradient for the formation on F1. So F1 can produce ATP. Uh, from ADP, uh, from phosphorylation of ADP and uh, inorganic phosphate. So, the protein gradient leads to the changes of conformation, including ATP synthase. So, ATP synthase, it has three possible conformation. It has open or, or low affinity for substrate, loose, not catalytically active, binds to ADP and PI, organic phosphate, Tight binding, catalytically active, binds ATP. So, this site interconvert as a result of proton flux. Okay, the F1, it doesn't move, okay? The one that is uh, move is the site, uh, the site change, okay? As the proton SH plus being moved from uh, intermembrane to the matrix of mitochondria. So, this side uh, result of a proton flux. Proton flux, it converts L to T, loose form to tight form which produce ATP. Proton flux also converts tight form to open form which release the ATP. So, we look into it here. So, the release of ATP from ATP synthase, we have three sides here. Okay, you can see O, open, loose, L. Okay, type binding T. Okay, L-O-T here. Okay. So, how can I show it to you without cursor? So, look at the first figure here where ATP is bind to the T, type binding T. So, basically, when ATP is bind, it's still, we still cannot release the ATP because it only bind to them, to, the, to this side. Okay, so you can see from this first uh, first figure, there's no binding uh, on site LO, but there's a binding of ATP on T site. So what happened is when AD, when there's an ADP plus P plus phosphate, it binds to the loose form. Okay, L. Okay, and then it rotates. Okay, when it rotates, what happened is, okay, L becomes T. Okay. They do not move. The conformation only. Uh, only the conformation change from L, from T to L to O. Okay, so when ADP plus P binds to the L side, then the conformation change. Okay, the conformation change from L to T. What happened is T. Whenever it is in T form, there's a formation of ATP. But the formation of ATP, it is catalytically bind. It doesn't release the ATP yet. Okay. So, for the second figure there, ADP plus phosphate P, okay, in L form, okay. So, it changed the formation, changed to T, tight form. So, it can become ATP. And then the O side, eh? which is uh, from the first figure, O side. What happened to O side? O side become L. Okay, you can see figure number three there. O side, the conformation change, it becomes L. Okay, so ADP can bind to that side, L side. Okay, and then when the, uh, when the conformation change to T, okay, what happened is when the conformation change to T, uh, it creates, uh, it form ATP. So when you look at the T side, okay, what happened to T side? At first, first figure, T 
T-side ATP bind. Second figure, okay. Second figure ADP binds to the L-side. Third figure, what happened to the ATP? ATP changed to the O-side. Okay. Formation of T-side becomes O-side. So ATP can be released. Every time they are in the O-side, okay, O conformation, ATP can be released from the formation uh, from the uh, ATP synthase. Okay, this ATP synthase doesn't move. The one that move is the side. L become T, O become L, okay, and then T become O. Okay, it moves like that. So when it is in L form, ADP plus P will bind. Okay, and then it becomes T. ATP will be created, will be formed. Okay, what happened then? T become O. Then it release the ATP. So the 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 cycle, this cycle continues. I hope you can understand about this. Huh? So I just repeat ATP synthase here, it doesn't move. The, the one that change is the conformation change. Okay. So effect of proton flux through ATP synthase, where proton flux converts okay, L side to T side, which produce ATP, where proton flux also converts T to O side which release the ATP. Whenever they are in O form, it can release the ATP. So if there's no O form a conformation there, ATP will stick and bind to the ATP synthase without being released. So that's the point. So in this chemical osmotic coupling, proton gradient is crux, okay, is the uh, crux of the method. The flow of protons that drive the synthase and ATP production. But then in conformation coupling, a change in the shape of the synthase, okay, that is bound ATP, uh, just like this one. This is the conformation change of uh, ATP synthase. So, two NADH molecule from glycolysis in the, okay, this is just overall, huh? two NADH molecule from glycolysis in cytosol cannot cross in the mitochondrial, mitochondrial membrane to enter ETC. So, this electron can be transferred to a carrier that cross the membrane. So the number of ATP molecule generated depends on the nature of the carrier which varies according to the type of cell in which it occurs. So this is the last part. Huh? What is this part? So this is very basic, very simple. We have two types of shuttle because NADH like it mentioned here, NADH from glycolysis cannot Glycolysis where glycolysis occur in the cytosol. It cannot cross in the mitochondrial membrane to enter ETC. Okay, so what happened is they need the electron from NADH. So they need to have a shuttle. Okay, so this shuttle that can transfer NADH, uh, that can transfer the electron across the membrane. So we look into it of shuttle mechanism. What is shuttle mechanism? It transport metabolites between mitochondria and cytosol. So we have glycerol phosphate shuttle which is found in muscle and brain. And another one is mallet aspartate shuttle which is found in kidney, liver and uh, we look into it later on. Okay, so we look first glycerol phosphate shuttle which found in muscle and brains. Okay, glycolysis produce two NADH molecule. NADH cannot cross mitochondrial membrane, but glycerol phosphate and dehydroxyacetone phosphate can cross the mitochondria. So what is glycerol phosphate? What is dehydroxyacetone phosphate? This is glycolysis. Step number five in glycolysis. Okay, where DHAP, remember DHAP and G3P. DHAP must be converted to G3P because it uh, before it uh, continue the glycolysis pathway. So this is what happened. Where is it? So uh, NADH, uh, this one done. 
So NADH uh, cannot cross the mitochondrial membrane but glycerophosphate and dehydroxyacetone can cross the membrane. So this FAD dependent enzyme on the outer face of the inner mitochondrial membrane, it oxidizes glycerophosphate. Okay, that is produced by the reduction of dehydroxyacetone phosphate. So what happened is in the cytosol, okay, in the cytosol, do we have, okay, here. This is cytosol, here outside here is cytosol, so this is the mitochondria. NADH cannot cross the membrane. So what happened is NADH plus H plus becomes NAD plus. So where where does where's where's the the electron? Okay, this uh, reaction are coupling with the reaction of DHAP dehydroxyacetone to three G uh, G three P glycerol phosphate. Okay, it transfer uh, sorry from DHAP it form glycerol phosphate. Okay, at the same time with okay you cannot I forgot you cannot see my here. Okay, let's see dehydroxyacetone phosphate first. DHAP. DHAP will be converted to glycerol phosphate. Glycerol phosphate also known as G3P. So go back and revise about the glycolysis pathways. So at the same time of this reaction, NADH plus H plus plus H plus will be converted to NAD plus. Okay, so when this happens, Glycerol phosphate enter the mitochondria. Okay, in the mitochondria, what happened is this. Remember this molecule, glycerol phosphate, that enter the mitochondria. So inside the mitochondria, glycerol phosphate can be converted back again to DHAP, dehydroxyacetone phosphate. Dehydroxyacetone phosphate can cross the mitochondria membrane to the cytosol okay and then it the this cycle repeat again okay it converts back to glycerol phosphate nadh plus h plus can be converted back to nad plus so this cycle converts are uh, uh, recycled okay so this glycerol phosphate once it cross the mitochondrial membrane it is in the matrix of mitochondria as glycerol phosphate this glycerol phosphate okay we have this mitochondria glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase that is the enzyme that catalyzes the formation of dhap from glycerol phosphate okay when g3p glycerol phosphate converted to dhap fad okay we pick up the electrons Okay, remember the electron from NAD, uh, NADH just now? Okay, but then once inside the mitochondria, the electron being picked up by FAD to form FADH2. Okay, this FADH2, remember, it goes into the complex number 2 of ETC. So, it skip complex 1 because it gives this electron to FAD. So FAD, remember FAD, when it accepts the electron, it becomes FADH2 plus uh, FADH2. Okay, this FADH2 will be converted. The, so this electron is in complex, uh, will be passed through in complex number two. So it skip complex number one. So totally, in total, when it skip complex number one, meaning less proton has been pumped from the matrix to the intermembrane space of mitochondria. Okay, can you imagine this? Huh? I hope you can imagine this. Huh? Okay, remember in ETC, we have, uh, we pump for H plus in complex one, no H plus being pumped in complex two, four H plus in complex three, two H plus in complex four. Remember, Okay, but if we use glycerol phosphate shuttle, we skip complex number one because electron from NADH, okay, electron from NADH in glycolysis, okay, uh, it's being passed to glycerol phosphate, glycerol phosphate cross the membrane, mitochondrial membrane, and then that electron being picked up by FAD. 
FADH becoming FADH2. FADH2 uh, will continue with complex number 2 of ETC. Okay, that is why it skip complex number 1. Because remember, complex number 1 is for NADH. Alright, so what happened is only how, how many of uh, H ion will be pumped? No ion will be pumped in complex number 2. But complex number 3, it continues when electron being transported. 4 H plus will be pumped and complex 4, uh, 2 H plus will be pumped. Total of 6 H plus. Okay, so for this glycerol phosphate shuttle, only total of six hydrogen ion will be pumped from matrix to intermembrane space. Okay. So for malad expected shuttle, it is found in knee, liver, and heart, the one that is active. So NADH produced in glycolysis used to reduce oxaloacetate into malad. So this is different part, uh, different shuttle. Just now it used uh, glycerophosphate. Okay. So this one it used malad aspartate. Malad aspartate is basically uh, amino acid. So NADH produced in glycolysis is used to reduce to oxaloacetate into malad. So this is TCA cycle. Just now glycerophosphate, they use glycolysis. Huh? Okay. This transfer the electron pair and regenerates NAD plus. Similar, similar with uh, glycerophosphate. But then it reduces oxaloacetate into malate. So malate cross the mitochondria membrane. Okay. When malate cross the mitochondria membrane, it enters the matrix. Okay, because oxaloacetate cannot enter, they cannot cross the mitochondrial membrane. So when malate moves across the membrane, it exchange with alpha ketoglutarate. So the movement of malate, when malate enter uh, when malate enter the mitochondrial membrane, uh, when it cross the mitochondrial membrane to the matrix of mitochondria, alpha ketoglutarate from inside the mitochondria must must uh, exchange okay it must cross and go into the cytosol so when malate cross in alpha ketoglutarate must cross out so that is what it means by in exchange they must exchange so there's two ways huh? malas go malate goes in alpha ketoglutarate goes out they must be exchanged so this alpha ketoglutarate when it cross from intermembrane space to the cytosol, it must be oxidized to oxaloacetate. Okay, then the cycle repeat oxaloacetate for malate. Malate go in, go in, it's exchanged to alpha ketoglutarate. Alpha ketoglutarate move out to cytosol from intermembrane space. So, what happened to malate in the uh, intermembrane space? Uh, here. So, oxaloacetate. OAA is oxaloacetate. They cannot move cross inner mitochondrial membrane. So transamination reacts to convert oxaloacetate to aspartate. So the aspartate now can flow in and out of the inner mitochondria in exchange for glutamate. Okay, aspartate now can flow out of inner mitochondria and then therefore they must exchange with glutamate. Let's see. Okay, here is the figure. This is cytosol. This is the mitochondria. Oh, okay, you cannot see. Okay, cytosol, the, 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 the white one, and mitochondria, the pink one. Okay. Similar NADH plus H plus to form NAD plus, it gives the electron. Okay, when it gives the electron, how to give the electron? in the formation of oxaloacetate to malate. Okay, hope you can see uh, where oxaloacetate forming malate. So this malate go into the mitochondria. Okay, cross the membrane. Okay, this malate in the mitochondria, uh, in the mitochondria membrane, uh, sorry, in the mitochondria matrix, okay, uh, trans converts to oxaloacetate. It is inside there. So this oxaloacetate, being converted to or uh, being changed to aspartate. Okay, this aspartate 
can cross the inner mitochondria membrane, go to the cytosol. Okay, this aspartate, when it moves to the cytosol, when it cross the membrane, move to the cytosol, aspartate once uh, converted back via transamination uh, to form oxaloacetate. So, this is the cycle. Okay, the one that move across, uh, mallet and aspartate. Okay, can you see there? Mallet and aspartate that cross the mitochondria membrane, inner mitochondria membrane. Okay, there's both oxaloacetate in cytosol as well as in the mitochondria. Okay, so here NADH, uh, sorry, the, the electron from mallet in the, uh, in the mitochondria, in the pink mitochondria here, when it converted to oxaloacetate, what happened is it's being picked up by NAD+. This electron being picked up by NAD+, producing NADH plus H+. Okay, so this NADH will go to the complex number one of ETC. Okay, what happens if it goes to complex number one? So in total of 10 hydrogen ion will be pumped out in the ETC. Okay, remember complex one, four hydrogen ion. Complex two, no hydrogen ion. Complex three, four. Complex four, two. Total of four, four, two. 10 total of hydrogen ion will be pumped if we use this myelid aspartate shuttle. Understand? So, that is why in myelid aspartate shuttle, 2.5 molecule of ATP are produced from NADH. And in glycerophosphate shuttle, 1.5 molecule of ATP for each NADH. So why, huh? Uh, remember why we count this uh, 10 and 8? Huh? Okay, if we use mallet as protect shuttle, total of 10 H plus ion will be formed. Okay, to form one ATP molecule, we need four hydrogen ion. Okay, four hydrogen ion, uh, we need four hydrogen ion to form one ATP molecule. So you just can divide lah, 10 divided by 4. So you get 2.5. Okay, if we only produce 8 ATP like the one glycerophosphate when it miss, when it skip complex number 1, it can only produce 8 hydrogen ion. Okay, so 8 uh, divided by 4, then you get 1.5 basically. Okay, to produce 1 molecule of ATP. And not 8, 6, sorry. 6 divided by 4, you get 1.5 molecule of ATP. Okay, that is why shuttle mechanism is the point that affects the overall yield of ATP in the tissue. So you cannot, you it's hard for you to know which, how many ATP in total will be produced unless you know which shuttle is being used. Okay, so in order for us to know the total of ATP, we need to know is it in kidney, is it happening in kidney? in liver cell or in muscle cell, in brain cell, or because that is where the shuttle mechanism takes place. So in complete oxidation of glucose, total of 30 or 32 molecule of ATP are produced for each molecule of glucose depending on the shuttle mechanism. So how do you know which shuttle to be used? Then you need to know where is the mechanism takes place, okay? So here, ATP generation in glycolysis and Krebs cycle, then you have this, if you use mallet as per shuttle, you get 32 ATP, uh, ATP. If you get glycerophosphate shuttle, you get 30 ATP, the green one. So, so in, in conclusion, ATP generation in, create, uh, in glycolysis and Krebs cycle. Okay. Krebs cycle, including the conversion of pyruvate to acetic-CoA, which is the pyruvate decarboxylation. Eh? So, total of 25 ATP molecule per 6 carbon glucose. Okay, for glycolysis, 1 ATP molecule for 1 3 carbon glyceride uh, 6 phosphate, 2 NADH molecule per 6 carbon glucose will produce okay, 3 ATP molecule per 6 carbon glucose through glycerophosphate shuttle or 5 ATP molecule if you use mallet aspartate shuttle. So, 
basically in total you get 30 or 32 ATP molecule. So here is the uh, summary, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So what happened? TCA cycle was the reaction and overall reaction. Okay, eventually you get ATP production per pyruvate. Huh? So remember one glucose produced two molecules of pyruvate. So this is only for per pyruvate. Okay. All right.